Welcome! This video will be a basic tutorial on limited vascular compression ultrasound for detection of deep venous thrombosis. Special thanks to Dr. Cameron Bastin of the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania for his help with this video. Comfort with the limited compression ultrasound for DVT is an important skill in the ICU because assessing for DVTs quickly and accurately using bedside ultrasound can shorten time to treatment of venous thromboembolism in our critically ill patients. The goal of this video is to provide an introduction to the basics of bedside ultrasound for assessment of DVT. By the end of these 10 minutes, I hope you'll feel comfortable with probe selection and basic scanning technique for the DVT study become familiar with visualizing and obtaining views of the relevant femoral and popliteal anatomy, be able to recognize a normal and an abnormal scan, and know how to avoid common pitfalls when scanning for DVTs. It's important to note that we will be discussing two-zone ultrasound rather than two-point ultrasound, because while scanning at only one point in each of the femoral and the popliteal region, or two-point ultrasound, has shown good sensitivity in the ED setting, Two-zone ultrasound, focusing on the major vascular junctions in each region, has shown higher sensitivity in the ICU. First, we'll discuss which probe to use when scanning for DVTs, as well as the basic probe positioning that will allow you to obtain the best views. For most DVT scans, you will use the high-frequency linear probe, shown on the left. The ultrasound machine should be set to venous or vascular setting. If your patient has a larger body habitus, it can sometimes be helpful to use the curvilinear probe, shown on the right, set to abdominal mode. When scanning, the indicator marker should be pointing to the patient's right. Essentially, all views will be obtained with the probe taking axial slices of the vessel of interest. In particular, in the femoral region, you should hold the probe like a pencil and ensure that your hand is anchored against the patient's skin for stability. Scanning the popliteal vessels can be a little more tricky. First, let's take a look at the top two panes, which show options for scanning the right leg. You can either keep a pencil grip, as shown on the left, or you can use an overhand grip where you hold the probe like a microphone, which is shown on the right. In the bottom two panes, we see options for scanning the left leg. So on the left side, I'm scanning left-handed, and on the right side, I'm using a pencil grip with my right hand, but facing the patient's feet. Notice that in all positions, it's helpful to hold the knee with your non-scanning hand, which stabilizes the knee when you apply pressure with the probe. Whatever you choose to do, it's important to find a comfortable position that you can sustain for several minutes of scanning and that gives you a good view of your ultrasound screen. It's important to apply pressure directly in the axis of your probe, because if you apply pressure straight down and your probe is pointed superiorly or inferiorly, you won't actually be visualizing the area you're applying pressure to, and it'll appear that the vein is not compressing. Here we see an example of compression off axis. Although the operator may be applying significant compression, the slice that is seen by the ultrasound is out of the plane of the pressure, and so the vein will not appear to completely collapse. Now that you're comfortable with the basics of probe selection and positioning, let's take a look at the femoral vascular anatomy. This is a representation of the femoral vascular anatomy of the right leg. The common femoral vein runs medial to the common femoral artery. The great saphenous vein, which is a superficial vein, branches off medially from the common femoral vein, and then the common femoral vein branches into the deep femoral and the femoral vein, both of which are deep veins. The first point where we will obtain our images roughly corresponds to the femoral crease, or where the leg naturally bends. In cross-section, the common femoral vein is medial to the pulsatile common femoral artery. A short distance inferior to that, we will look for the offshoot of the great saphenous vein from the common femoral vein, which may occur slightly superior to or at the same level as the bifurcation of the common femoral artery into the superficial femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. Finally, inferior to that, we will look for the bifurcation of the common femoral vein into the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein. It's important to note that these bifurcations can actually be very close to each other in real life. This is the femoral vasculature of the right leg as seen on ultrasound. 
Focus first on the pain on the right. As a reminder, the patient's skin is at the top of the screen, their femur is at the bottom of the screen, and our indicator is on the patient's right. Medial, or away from the indicator, we see the common femoral vein, and lateral, toward the indicator, we see the common femoral artery. As we move inferiorly, we see the bifurcation of the common femoral artery, and right after that, the great saphenous vein splits off the common femoral vein and moves medially. Then you can see the common femoral vein split into the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein. Now watch again, this time focusing on the pain on the left. Notice what small hand movements are needed to allow you to see the entire relevant femoral anatomy. Also note that my hand is anchored to the patient to help control the sliding of the probe. Now that you know the basics of the vascular anatomy, next we will review how to assess the deep veins for the presence of thrombus. Starting with a view of the femoral vein and artery, gently compress the vessels until you see mild deformation of the artery, at which point the two walls of the vein should be completely collapsed and touching each other. This is normal and indicates that there is no clot in the area you're examining. Briskly compress every centimeter, especially at branch points, applying pressure perpendicular to the vessels with the vessels centered in your screen, moving proximal to distal. Here we see normal compression of the femoral vein, normal compression of the great saphenous vein, and then normal compression of both the deep femoral and femoral vein. These veins show normal compression and are therefore very unlikely to contain DVTs. Here's a close-up view of your hand position and what you should see on the ultrasound. First, focus on the ultrasound image on the right. Notice that pressure is being applied to the point that the artery is barely deformed, and at this point, the veins are completely collapsed. Also, notice that I'm compressing at the branch points of the veins. This is because branch points are where clot is most likely to form, and so they're the highest yield points to scan. Now, focus on my hand and the pain on the left. Watch the amount of pressure that's needed to achieve collapse of the veins. Also notice my hand remaining anchored to the patient so that the probe doesn't slide when pressure is applied. Now that we've seen what normal looks like, let's take a look at an example of a non-compressible femoral vein. This is a scan of the left leg, and here we see the common femoral vein medial to the pulsatile common femoral artery. Pressure is being applied until the artery is slightly deformed, but the vein does not compress. We also see some echogenic material in the vein that's likely thrombus, but it's important to note that in acute DVT, there frequently is not echogenic material in the vessel. So that wraps up the femoral region. Next, let's take a look at the popliteal vascular anatomy. Here we're looking at the posterior aspect of the right knee. The femoral vein has turned into the popliteal vein, which runs superficial to the popliteal artery. The popliteal vein then splits into the anterior tibial vein and the tibioperineal trunk, which further divides into the perineal vein and the posterior tibial vein. Note that this patient's popliteal vein actually runs slightly lateral to her popliteal artery. So let's see what it looks like on ultrasound. First focus on the pain on the right. Once again, the top of the ultrasound screen is skin, the bottom of the screen is the tibial plateau deep to the popliteal vessels, and our indicator is on the patient's right. Here we see the popliteal vein superficial and lateral to the popliteal artery, and as the probe moves inferiorly, the popliteal vein essentially trifurcates in this patient into the three calf veins, the anterior tibial vein, the perineal vein, and the posterior tibial vein. Now focus on the pain on the left. Again, notice what small movements are needed to scan through the relevant anatomy. Now let's talk about the compression scan of the popliteal vessels. Starting with a view of the popliteal vein and artery, again gently compress the vessels until you see mild deformation of the artery, repeating this process about every centimeter until you see trifurcation of the popliteal vein and ensuring to compress at branch points. Here we see normal compression of the popliteal vein, as well as normal compression of the trifurcation into the calf veins. Note that this patient's popliteal vein runs lateral to her popliteal artery, whereas in most people it will be superficial to the artery. Here is a close-up view of your hand position and what you should see on ultrasound. Again, notice that I'm stabilizing the knee with my non-scanning hand, 
to provide counterforce for my compressions. Now that we've seen normal compression, here is an example of a non-compressible popliteal vein. We see the popliteal vein superficial to the artery, and at the point of deformation of the popliteal artery, there is still no collapse of the popliteal vein. We again see echogenic material in the vein, which supports the conclusion that a thrombus is present, but is not necessary to make the diagnosis. So now that you know the basics of compression ultrasound, let's discuss some common pitfalls that you should avoid before we wrap up. Take a look at this video. There's a superficial structure that's anechoic and non-compressible, so it may be confused for a thrombus. However, this is actually a nerve. You can distinguish a nerve from a vein because even a vein that contains clot should be anechoic in the areas surrounding the clot, whereas a nerve will look hyperechoic and have a honeycombed appearance for its whole length. Also, a nerve demonstrates anisotropia, which means that the echogenicity changes dramatically when the scanner changes the angle of insonation. Another thing you want to watch out for is reactive lymph nodes, which are non-compressible and may cause leg swelling and redness similar to a DVT. You can distinguish lymph nodes from vessels by sliding up and down and visualizing the beginning and end of a lymph node, whereas your vessel will be a continuous tube. Another finding that can cause signs and symptoms that resemble a DVT is a Baker's cyst. On ultrasound, a Baker's cyst looks like a well-defined anechoic pocket of fluid that has a neck that extends into the joint space. Another common source of confusion is mistaking superficial vessels for deep vessels. Here it looks like we're visualizing major veins of the leg. However, if we zoom out, you can see that the real vessels of interest are deep to the vessels that we were scanning before. That's why it's important to have the anchoring anatomy of the femur or the tibial plateau to make sure that you're ruling out clot in the actual deep vessels. Lastly, take a look at this vessel. Here we see echogenic material in the vein that seems to have turbulent movement. This is known as smoke or rouleau formation, which is a common finding with modern machines, but is not known to be pathological. The vessel should still be compressible, which highlights why a positive DVT study requires a non-compressible vein, not only an echogenic vein. Finally, a comment on the upper extremity DVT scan. The upper extremity DVT scan requires the same technique that we've reviewed for the lower extremities. The anatomy is slightly different, but again, the need is to visualize all the major vascular junctions. Of note, the diagnostic performance of the upper extremity DVT scan is less well known. So that concludes our video. To recap, we discussed that the vascular probe is the probe typically used for the DVT study, and we discussed basic patient positioning. Then we discussed the femoral anatomy with the common femoral vein medial to the artery, the great saphenous vein splitting off medially, and the common femoral vein splitting into the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein. We discussed the popliteal anatomy with the tibial plateau anchoring us on the bottom of the screen and the popliteal vein running superficial to the popliteal artery before trifurcating into the calf veins. Next, we went through how to perform the compression scan, applying vertical pressure every one centimeter and at vascular junctions until the artery starts to deform with a positive scan having a non-compressible vein, often with echogenic material visualized inside the vessel. In the popliteal region, we provide counterpressure to the patient's knee while we scan proximal to distal from popliteal vein through the trifurcation into the calf vessels. Lastly, we discussed common pitfalls, including confusing a nerve for a non-compressible vein, confusing lymph nodes for vasculature, misidentifying Baker cysts, mistaking superficial vessels for deep vessels, and confusing smoke for thrombus. Thank you for watching this introduction to compression ultrasound for detection of DVT. I hope that you will feel empowered to look for DVTs in your ICU patients with the support of an ultrasound trained intensivist team. Special thanks to Dr. Cameron Bastin, Dr. Emma Rogers, Dr. Regan Tudor for medical illustrations, and media technology and production at the Perlman School of Medicine for their assistance with this video.